There's no secret. There's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent. Be still and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't going to happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. If you are looking to live at the tip of the spear when it comes to health optimization, join my private membership group, Fully Optimized Health. Dot com and get the latest and greatest on hormone optimization, peptides, fitness, fat loss, and most importantly, raising your vibration. Again, go over to fullyoptimizedhealth.com and sign up today. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you may be around the world. I am Jay Campbell, and of course, you are watching the Jay Campbell podcast. And I'm very excited today to be joined in my StreamYard virtual studio with an amazing man, Dr. Ross Pelton. Dr. Ross, what is going on, my brother? Hey, hello, Jay. It's really a wonderful opportunity to be with you and all your viewers. So uh, there's a lot going on, and uh, we're going to talk about rapamycin, mTOR, and autophagy today and get these people into people's uh, health lexicon. Yes, man. And uh, it's an honor and privilege, and I'm humbled to have you here today. And you guys, Dr. Ross Pelton, somewhat of a legend in the anti-aging space. He's literally written 12 books on a lot of different topics. So him and I are going to go in probably who knows how many different directions. We do have some talking points here today. And as you can see, he is a very high vibration individual with his energy. So this is going to be a very awesome show. Um, again, you're a natural pharmacist, an author of 12 books. Let me just get your take. You know, we were talking off air about like um, – the guys at International Anti-Aging and our friends, you know, Phil Mikens and of course the owner and really that whole group and all the things they're doing. Medicine is essentially becoming decentralized, right? So since the last three years with the scamdemic or the epidemic, whatever you want to call it, whatever just <laughs> happened to us, right? We were all somewhat disillusioned in some capacity or way. All of us were affected in our lives. Um, but the, as I say, the benefit that came out of it was that there's been massive decentralization, right? You have pharmaceutical groups, offshore pharmacies, uh, physician platforms who are now offering unbelievable golden age, you know, uh, healing therapies, medicines, uh, biomolecules, bioregulators, peptides, peptides, all these amazing things, right? Yeah. All these things that are in the marketplace now that humanity has a quote unquote choice uh, to choose from. Now, do you see it getting only better or do you seeing like the dark side attempting to clamp down on our ability to access these things? I mean, what are your general thoughts? My hope is that things will get better and, and looser. I am in favor of people having personal responsibility for their own health and being able to make some of their decisions. Um, I think the AMA provide some useful benefits and oversight but and then that's where it stops Ross. yeah it's, it's it's very restrictive though and i <laughs> i am not a big fan of big pharma i call myself a recovering pharmacist you know? <laughs> and i've been passionate about about health and longevity for decades and um, i think we're talking about rapamycin today and i mentioned yeah. to you off air jay i think rapamycin is safer than tylenol and right. ibuprofen and many other things that people have open access to so I think this uh, should be easily accessible and people should be able to have access to the health benefits that rapamycin provides. And I'm grateful to International Anti-Aging Systems for making a proprietary brand of rapamycin called Rapapro right. available uh, from overseas sources and uh, mail order. And I've been ordering it myself and, um, and actually people can get a discount on their first order if they use a professional code that we've got. And so uh, we'll talk about that today. Yeah. Awesome. And, uh, yeah, you're the, you're in the right place, man, because this is not a show that supports big pharma. Now, granted, and I will always say there are amazing medications that do come from the pharma space. Um, but just as there is just as many that are harmful, obviously long-term because of their side effects and whatnot. And also just because as you said, and I love to say that I, so my statement is you have to become the proactive scientist of your own health. And you said you're for personal accountability and, and personal responsibility and choosing, uh, you know, whatever you want to use for your health and stuff like that. And that's so obviously we're very aligned. And I kind of see people like us now really in this place in society now in this third dimensional, uh, you know, mystical experience that we're all having um, sorting, sort of lining up like the, the like minded hey, people. One of the books I wrote is titled The Drug Induced Nutrient Depletion Handbook. Yeah. So I teach pharmacists and physicians and everybody about the nutritional deficiencies that the drugs people are taking will cause. And when I wrote that book, 
I was astounded to learn that oral contraceptives deplete more nutrients than any other class of drugs. So that motivated me to write a book called The Pill Problem to teach women about the nutritional deficiencies from oral contraceptives and how to prevent them and heal from them. I mean, man, don't even get me going about oral contraceptives. I mean, you know, basically that has the water supply, the runoff from oral contraceptives of the last 30 years in the water supply has created this disturbing, you know, species wide situation where people are sexually, you know, identification, sexual identification confusion is basically endemic now. And again, you know, you don't get a lot of people talking about this because they don't want to talk about this. But I mean, I literally just did a podcast this morning with someone, Dave Lee, shout outs to Dave, um, about the idea that literally so many people nowadays, younger people are confused because they literally do not have enough circulating hormones in their bodies from what you just literally said. So they are literally identity confused due to the contamination. And again, it's not just, you know, birth control pills, it's endocrine disrupting chemicals. Yeah. It's plasticizers. You know, it's the stuff in the air from, you know, again, just industrial uh, machinery and expansion. I mean, there's so many things, Doc, that are causing this worldwide contamination zone, especially in the big cities, even the blue light, right, that you and I are experiencing right now from our computers also decimates our endocrine system. So it's difficult. You to be healthy today, you got to work at it and you got to exactly get educated. Right. It's very difficult to navigate the modern modernized world. And obviously that's what we're going to be talking about on this podcast today, but you're right. You have to be extremely proactive. You have to take matters into your own hand. Your family physician is not going through your medical record, attempting to create prevention strategies for you. You know what I mean? All right. So look, let's get into it. So, you know, in your book, you talk about rapamycin. I love rapamycin. I've written an article about it. it As I told you, and I want you to convince me that I should be I'm not using it yet. Obviously, it's a tool in the tool belt, and it's definitely in my planned arsenal, but I'm 52. A lot of the research when we did the article was saying that, you know, most people that will find value in it, and I'm sure you're going to find that I'm wrong, but, you know, the research that we were, you know, interpreting was that mid-50s, you know, is is when you should start using rapamycin. But again, please convince me otherwise, because I would love to add that. And as you said, our friends at International Aging Systems have Rapapro, so it's readily accessible. You don't need a script. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I think that people in their 30s and 40s can start considering taking rapamycin. That's awesome. Um, and so there's two main themes in my book, Jay. Yeah. One is the drug rapamycin, which is absolutely fascinating. The most effective life extension drug that's ever been discovered, 20 to 60% life extension in multiple species of animals. Yep. Human trials are looking promising. Uh, So the drug itself is very exciting. But to my way of thinking, the more important topic in my book is the discussion of mTOR and autophagy. And most people aren't familiar with these terms yet, but they're going to be household words. And and these two mechanisms regulate cellular metabolism and health and the aging process of every single cell in your body. Right. And so let's talk about rapamycin first, and then I'll get into the mTOR autophagy discussion. So rapamycin is a natural substance that's produced by a strain of soil bacteria. So I like to emphasize that. This isn't some weird compound that a pharmaceutical corporation has made that nature has never seen before. This is produced naturally in nature by a strain of soil bacteria. And David Sabatini, back in 1994, discovered that when rapamycin is absorbed across a cellular membrane, goes into a cell, it binds to an enzyme. And this enzyme got named by Sabatini as mTOR, which stands for the mechanistic target of rapamycin. It's just the enzyme that rapamycin binds to. So what does this mTOR enzyme do? It's a master signaling molecule that notices when nutrients are available to the cell. And when nutrients are available, mTOR sends out signals that says, use these nutrients to build and grow new proteins, new enzyme, new cellular components. The other side of the equation is 1990, excuse me, 2016, uh, a Japanese scientist wins the Nobel prize for his discovery of autophagy. And autophagy is a process in cells that gets activated when no nutrients are available. Right. 
And so when mTOR is not being activated, there's no nutrients, autophagy gets activated and autophagy is critically important for health and longevity. It's the primary detoxification process for every cell in your body. And it's the primary process for rebuilding and renewing your body. And so this mTOR autophagy ratio, I call it, for 99.9% .9 of human evolution, these things were in balance. And these days, almost everybody alive is seriously out of balance. Right. <laughs> Dramatically out of balance. is when nutrients are available. For most right. of human evolution, Jay, people didn't get up in the morning, go to the kitchen, open the refrigerator, and start making breakfast. Exactly. People didn't eat three meals a day. No. And these days, compared to our ancestral humans, people are eating all the time. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, in-between meal snacks, desserts, evening cocktails. And so mTOR is always getting stimulated and autophagy is not getting any activation. And the analogy I use is like a race car. They're incredible vehicles. They can go really fast, but you can't drive those cars forever with the pedal to the metal. And just like a sprinter in, in track and field, they can go fast, but only for a while. You got to stop and have rest and rejuvenation and rebuilding processes. And that's what most of humanity is missing right now. Yep. Is what rapamycin does for you. It goes into the cell, binds to mTOR, partially inhibits it. So activation of autophagy starts to get kicked into gear. So that's a little, quick little summary and overview of these terms and the processes involved. So, I mean... So, I mean, I have a lot of, you said a lot, there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, at what point, how does a person know from a testing standpoint, um, you know, cause I mean, let's be honest, doc, like people aren't getting this information from their local family doctor, right? right. They're not, they're not getting their lab work. Uh, even if they're even getting their lab work done. And obviously both of us advocate for that stuff. And I'm big on biomarker responsibility and understanding inflammatory markers and all these different things. I talk about this ad nauseum, but at the end of the day, most people do not have any idea on how they can figure out if they're deficient, right? So it's like, at what point, what is your recommendation from a personal recommendation standpoint of like, how does a person know if they should start experimenting with slash using rapamycin? It's an educational process, Jay. And that's that my book is designed to <clears throat> accelerate everybody's learning curve about these topics. <clears throat> and when you understand that most people alive today are seriously out of balance in this mTOR autophagy ratio and yeah. how important it is to, to get autophagy activated, yeah. then you understand why rapamycin is important. Yeah. And when you start to take rapamycin and you partially inhibit mTOR and autophagy gets activated, every single cell in your body is going to start to work better. This is not a miracle fix. Yeah. You don't feel tremendously better overnight. I ask people, when you take a dose of vitamin C or your vitamin D capsule, how much different do you feel the next day? Right. You don't. You take it because you understand why it's important. Exactly. Same with rapamycin. This is a long-term process of slowing down biological aging. There's a Dr. James Fries that wrote a study, published a study or a paper back in the 1980s that he got soundly criticized for. It's called of the rectangularization of the aging curve and the compression of morbidity. What it, here's the aging curve. You start out healthy and then you start to go down, 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 30s and 40s, 50s and 60s, a continual increase in health problems and more and more medications and less energy and so forth. Rectangularization of the aging curves means you stay healthy for a much longer period of time. And at the very end, maybe around 110 or 120, you compress morbidity into a very short period of time. That's what we're all working at in anti-aging and life extension, right. slowing down biological aging. It's not just life extension. It's not just increasing your lifespan. It's increasing your health, health span. span. That's the key thing. And that's what rapamycin is doing for you, getting every single cell in your body to detoxify better and accelerating the process of rebuilding new cell, new proteins and no new enzymes. And the analogy I use to get people to understand how important autophagy is, Jay, if you got a flat tire on your car 
you can't change that tire until you take the bad tire off to get the new tire on. It's the same way with all these proteins and enzymes in your body. They're huge molecules, very complex shapes. Shape is the function of the enzyme and the protein. Everything is revolved around shape. But yep. over time, with stresses and free radical damage, the shape changes and they lose their function, but they don't go away. They're still there. They're just not functioning very well. Yeah. And so most people are functioning with damaged proteins and damaged enzymes. And, and what evidence do I have that this is affecting humans? We now have an epidemic of epidemics. <laughs> You know, when I was in my in 1950s and 60s, when I was a kid, we didn't have <laughs> cancer and heart disease and diabetes and arthritis and autism and osteoporosis right. and obesity. Right. And now they're all an epidemic. The health of mankind is in a serious decline. And I think this autophagy mTOR ratio being serious out of, out of balance is a fundamental mechanism that's causing or contributing to all these health problems. And it's actionable. People can yeah. fix this if they understand it. There's no doubt. I mean, I talk about autophagy. You're on the right channel. So, I mean, I talk about autophagy in all my books, um, you know, and, and also hormesis. And look, the reality is, it's very simple. If you can create your body an autophagic slash hormetic response by fasting, right? We're, we're, we're talking about rapamycin and I know we're about to get into fasting, but if you, if you taught, if you literally just train your body to become fast adapted, two days a week of 20 hours, 18 hours, 19 hours. And I like even longer, but you know, uh, fast intervals with no food, you know, drink. And by the way, I'm fasting right now, water, you know, again, again, I know there's a debate about dry fasting and water fasting and all that stuff, but obviously I like to be hydrated. I like the cells to stay hydrated, but if you can just train your body to fast and go psychologically and psychogenically, without food and without, you know, suppressing, as you know, and we can get into the spiritual component of this too, but the suppression of, you know, all the bodies, you know, screaming from the microbiome of feed me, feed me, feed me, you ultimately will, it's essentially, uh, Ross, you know, doc, a, a cellular fumigation response. Like you're yeah. literally getting rid of oxidative waste. Yep. You're, you're getting rid of free oxy radicals. You know, you're, you're, you're essentially cleansing your body from the inside out. And you're right. This is what will extend health span. Yep. Yes, you'll live longer, but your health will be better. You bet. Yep. And in animal models, every single disease related to aging responds to rapamycin. Yeah. Every cell in your body starts to work better. But yeah. if you've got bone on bone arthritis, right, or if you've got an aneurysm in your carotid artery, rapamycin is not going to fix that. Right. You know, the, it's not a miracle change for everything. Right. But it's really one of the fundamental things that's going to improve your long-term health. And that's, that's what everybody would really like to have healthy aging, healthy longevity. Yeah. So your dosage in the book that you recommend yeah. and, and, and getting into rapamycin, the medication, which is obviously difficult to come by versus the rapa pro, which is our friends at in international anti-aging cells. Um, do you have a recommendation like yeah. for one over the other based on the individual? You bet. And, and before I talk about that, Jay, let me back up and, and give a little bit more of the history of rapamycin. Sure. It will help people understand why this is so hard to get, why a lot of doctors aren't familiar with it. So when it was discovered, it was a first being researched as an antifungal drug. But the early researchers discovered that it suppresses the immune system. So yeah. all the original research came to a screaming halt. <clears throat> but in 1996, excuse me, 1999, September 1999, the FDA approved rapamycin for people that get a kidney transplant because organ transplant patients need to be on immune suppressing drugs for the rest of their life. So that was the first FDA approval for rapamycin. Samples of rapamycin got sent to the National Cancer Institute. They went crazy over it. They discovered that rapamycin is the first example of a totally new type of chemotherapy. Most chemotherapy drugs are called cytotoxic. They kill. They don't just kill rapidly dividing tumor cells. They kill rapidly dividing bone marrow cells and rapidly dividing epithelial cells that line your gastrointestinal tract. Most people don't realize that the epithelial cells in your GI tract that line your intestinal tract, they're the highest rate of turnover cells in your body. So those cells get damaged with chemotherapy also. But right. 
rapamycin is not cytotoxic, it's cytostatic. It stops cancer without all the cytotoxic side effects. So in the early 2000s, rapamycin got FDA approval for treating several different types of solid tuber cancers. Herein lies the problem. Most doctors won't write a prescription for a life extension enthusiast for chemotherapy or something that suppresses the immune system. <clears throat> but the breakthrough really came when a scientist by the name of Joan Manick was working for the multinational drug con pharmaceutical conglomerate Novartis. She had the enviable position of being able to research anything she was interested in. And she was interested in aging and she got interested in rapamycin and she divided a, a very unique study, took elderly people, 65 years old and older, divided them into four groups, a placebo group, a group that got a rapamycin called a rapalog, a rapamycin-like drug that had the same effects of rapamycin. One group took half a milligram every day. One group took five milligrams once a week. The fourth group took 20 milligrams once a week. They took their medication or the placebo for 12 weeks. Then she stopped and there was a washout period. And then all of them got the seasonal flu vaccine injection. Right. And she did blood work and measured how their immune system responded to the challenge of the flu vaccine. And five milligrams once a week <clears throat> was the sweet spot. Those elderly people got a 20% boost in the effectiveness of their immune system. If you're in your 60s or older and you boost the effectiveness of your immune system 20%, that's a big deal. So that's the first study that made this uh, allowed the scientific community to realize that taking rapamycin episodically once a week and partially inhibiting mTOR so you can activate autophagy has tremendous health benefits, but not taking it every single day, which then does a, suppress the immune system. So that was the big breakthrough. Amazing, amazing stuff. Um, all right, well, let's get into rapamycin then now. Yep. Let's like literally talk about your recommendations. And I know this is all covered in your book, but obviously for the yep. podcast, for the people that can't read, I just literally read a statistic this morning about how far reading has collapsed in the United States. It was essentially in Western schools, like young people. They now say that it's less than 14 minutes a day. The average person under the age of 18 reads. Can you imagine how pathetic that really is that people don't even read? Yeah. It's, it's really scary. It's very sad. Uh, but all we can do is keep helping to educate Doing what we do. the choice. Doing what we do. It's a choice. That's exactly right. It's a choice to read. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're a younger person and you're listening to this podcast, and I know I have a lot of those people out there, please, by all means read an hour a day. Do not say you do not have time to read. Reading is literally a catapult. Literally, it is a gigantic rocket ship to the cosmos or through the cosmos yeah. to expanding your intellectual capacity and not just your intellectual capacity, but your awareness. Yeah. And it also, um, it trains your brain. Plasticity, and, and baby. Exposed to new thoughts and new ideas. I encourage kids Every, all kids are online these days. They all know about computers and internet and so forth. Kids, get in a book group with kids your age online right. and That's read right. and talk about books. And I'm like, I'm an infomaniac, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I got three more, books more right my... next to me. Look at this. I got three books going right now. <laughs> First, I want to say that this is really a new frontier. We don't have all the answers. Sure. Right now, we say five or six milligrams once a week is the dose that most people are taking based on Joan Mannix's study. Yep. However, we don't know if five milligrams once a week is better than eight milligrams once a week, or should would you do better taking 10 milligrams every other week? We don't right. know the answer to these things, but yeah. we know that five or six milligrams once a week is very safe and very effective and provides big bang for your buck in terms of health outcomes. Um, I, I'm now a big advocate for doing blood testing on your rapamycin. The generic name for the drug rapamycin is serolimus. Right. So the blood test you want to ask for from LabCorp is serolimus. 
after I'd been taking rapamycin for over a year, I did my blood test and I found out my blood plasma levels weren't as high as I expected them to be or as high as I wanted them to be. Right. So I've now upped my dose to 10 to 12 milligrams a week and I'm getting blood levels where I want it to be. And I'm encouraging and emphasizing to people, if you don't test, you don't know. Right. You're just guessing. Right. So you don't know if I'm sure there's wide variation in people's ability to absorb rapamycin and metabolize it. And so test, test, test. Um, and you can get the, the lab test for serolimus through the Life Extension Foundation for $95. And they have doctors on staff, so they will send you the lab test uh, requisition. You can take it to LabCorp and get your blood drawn. I found out that you can go directly to LabCorp and get the same blood test for $54 instead of $95 from Life Extension, but it requires a prescription. Well, yeah. I went to my doc who's supportive. I've educated my doctor about rapamycin. <laughs> it's not you have to that. educate your doctor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. She wrote a prescription for the serolimus blood test that says one year standing order. That's awesome. I can take that to LabCorp anytime I want and get my blood tested. And we're advocating that people try to get their blood tests, their blood drawn roughly about 20 hours after ingesting their dose. Okay. It's too hard to target right exactly one or two hours after because you don't know if you can get into LabCorp. And, but if you go 20 hours, if, it, if it's 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 hours, that little window of time, if we're going to get a lot of information for people taking rapamycin at about 20 hours roughly, and we'll find out different, this is one way to tell whether a brand is well absorbed. What's your what's your blood level? And if we get a lot of people putting in their data, we'll get a lot of information uh, eventually. And the best place to get updated and ongoing information about rapamycin is the online rapamycin forum called rapamycin.news. So I encourage everybody listening to go to that website. There's an enormous amount of information there. You can put any question in and you'll find the threads to all the discussions on particular topics. Um, for people that can't find a physician who's willing to write them a prescription for rapamycin, there are doctors who will do telemedicine visits yeah. for rapamycin. So you can go on the rapamycin.news website and search for doctors who will do telemedicine visits. Uh, so that's another option. Or as we mentioned, uh, you can purchase Rapapro from International Anti-Aging Systems and get it shipped from overseas without a prescription. And a lot of people um, have complained. Some medical doctors have pushed back on me and say, you shouldn't be promoting that. That's illegal. Um, and there's a couple things that make this legal. Back in the 1980s, during the HIV AIDS epidemic, the FDA made a policy decision change that made it legal for people to import up to a three month supply of their personal medications. So that's one thing that makes importing Rapid Pro legal. The other thing is that International Anti-Aging Systems does not sell rapamycin or their proprietary brand Rapid Pro to the general public. It's a membership organization. How do you become a member? One cent of your first order is your membership fee. So that's how you become a member. And so this is all legal and it's been going on for quite a few years. Uh, International Anti-Aging Systems specializes in making difficult to obtain life extension drugs available from around the world. And now they have their proprietary brand Rapapro available. So back to who should take rapamycin and who shouldn't take it. Yeah. Inhibiting mTOR inhibits growth. Right. So you would never recommend rapamycin to a child, an infant, a child. I don't even think people in their 20s and 30s should be taking rapamycin because that's still a time when you're still going through a, a growth phase. Yep. Whether you should start in your late 30s or early 40s, we don't know the best time. And I'm sure different people would or can start at different ages. For example, somebody that's really healthy at 50 is different than somebody who's obese and has metabolic syndrome who's 30 years old. That younger person who's in poorer health might be able to start rapamycin earlier and get significant benefits. But again, we don't know the answer to this, but we do know that adults can safely take it. Um, the other group of people that should never take rapamycin are pregnant women because the developing fetus is the most rapid time of, of growth that we know of. So you don't want to inhibit that by giving rapamycin. 
So that's a little bit of an overview of who can take it. Um, Dr. Alan Green is a physician yep. in New York who's got over 1,200 patients on rapamycin yep. now. He's suggesting that elderly people can maybe get more benefit by taking higher doses. Um, I mentioned I've increased my dose to 10 sure. milligrams a week. But again, we don't have all the answers on this. Yeah. Things I recommend that people to do to track their progress. First of all, I think everybody should a baseline blood panel at the beginning so you've got something to compare it to three months, six months sure. after you get started on rapamycin. There are a couple of possible side effects from rapamycin, but they're very minimal. And as I mentioned, the, the side effects from rapamycin are far less severe, uh, severe than some of the side effects from easily available over-the-counter drugs like ibuprofen and Tylenol. Right. And Tylenols and uh, acetaminophen Horrible. is the number one cause of liver failure and liver transplants. Horrible for your liver. Yeah, horrible. <laughs> yeah. So, well, so, well, go ahead. Keep going. Go ahead. Um, no, I was just going to ask you about the difference between the rapamycin pro and the actual medicine. Okay, is there? Point. Do you do you do you notice? Because obviously you use both. Yeah. Do you notice right, a difference? A more different brands. Um, rapamycin is a difficult drug to absorb. It's it's fat soluble, and we don't absorb fat soluble nutrients very right. efficiently. Same with vitamin D and coenzyme Q10. They're fat soluble nutrients. Uh, if you're taking those, you want to take them at a, a meal that contains fat to enhance the absorption. Right. You'll get better absorption of rapamycin if you take it at a meal containing fat or along with some fat. Um, I'll, I sometimes will take half an avocado or um, some cottage cheese or some form of fat containing food along with my dose of rapamycin. So the question for you then right there is that if you're fasting... And the day that you're fasting, you're taking your rapamycin. And obviously, if you're only taking it once a week, right, like most people, then you just pick it a day that you're eating yeah. and you take it with food. So it really wouldn't be that big of a question. But if you did take it or let's say you forgot it and now you're on a fasting day and you're at like 18 or 20 hours right when you break it, you would take it then when you eat a fat with a fat soluble food at that moment in time, right? So 18 actually, or 19 hours. I've taken it multiple times without fat, just on an empty stomach, and you still get every sure. level. So it is getting absorbed, but you can enhance it uh, by ingesting it with fat. Right. Uh, a little bit about fasting. I'm, I'm on the same page with you, Jay. It's really very important. Yeah. Um, most people do the 16-8 protocol where you stop eating about eight o'clock at night and then don't eat anything until noon the next day. So you've gone 16 hours without food. That's probably the easiest right. uh, protocol. Some people fast, like you mentioned, uh, two days a week. Yep. Um, I personally have experimented with longer fasts. Me too. My wife went away on a, a retreat uh, and so she was gone and I decided to experiment. I did a two, two day fast. Nice. I thought it would be a miserable experience. Not at it all. Wasn't. I, no. I found it remarkably easy. And later I did a three-day fast. And yep. again, it was a crazy easy for me. I realized when I experimented with a longer fast, eating is primarily a habit. That's exactly right. I like grabbing a handful of nuts and I like having a, some cut up watermelon and so forth. But when I set my mind to not eat, to get into a fasting mode, I drink water, I drink herbal tea, I drink right. coffee, organic right. coffee with no and nothing else in it. You can't and put it's NCT oil in your organic coffee, Ross. Yeah, but I will admit people have different types of metabolism. That's true. And That's some right. people who try to fast will go into a, a hypoglycemic crash. That's right. And just can't fast adequately. Dr. So, Peter I mean, Diamo in his book, yeah. The Blood Type Diet, talks about this. And by the way, I have a pet theory. I mean, I'm kind of borrowing or extrapolating his. But the closer your, uh, let's just call your genetic ethnicity origin to the equatorial pool, the more efficient you are from an insulin metabolism standpoint, because again, you grew up around abundant food. You just reached up into the trees and there was fruit and yeah. whatever else versus more Slavic people like me, Northern European ancestry, but we were more hunter gatherers and especially the men, you know, they would go 36 to 40 hours without food, right? You would yeah. literally go, you're living in the tundra, you know, food was not abundant or plentiful. You had to kill what you ate. Right. So it's like, you're right. Like genetically, bioevolutionarily, our, uh, you know, <laughs> metabolisms have evolved to handle and process insulin differently. So you're right. But, but I will tell you this and to, to your point, 
we're nothing more if we get really deep in meta here we're nothing more than mind anyway right i mean we're basically worrying atoms and vibrating molecules and hopefully oscillating <laughs> waves of energy and frequency and so if you take your mind to a place of like i'm not going to eat for 36 to 48 and maybe like you said go three days and that's what i've done too i've gone up to like 74 hours and 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 and, and jason fung's book on alternate day fasting and by the way i fast every other day uh you know, sometimes 20 hours, sometimes 18 hours, sometimes I'll go an entire day and eat. And when I wake up in the morning, get 25, 26 hours in. But the bottom line is the research on when we start actually breaking down proteins uh, and amino acids is a lot longer than people think it is. Yep. Yep. You know, you know what I'm saying? So you're right. You literally can go about 76 hours uh, and that's even in hyper muscular athletic people, because this study was done in actually Olympic caliber track and field sprinters. At what point did there actually become, you know, muscle protein, muscle kind or uh, creatine kinase breakdown at the cellular level? And it was 76 hours yeah. in extremely conditioned athletes. So all these people that think if I don't eat, bro, I'm going to lose my muscle gains or I'm going to lose my muscle. It's complete hogwash. It's not possible. And as you know, Doc, the body is incredibly homeostatic, incredibly, incredibly dynamic. It will preserve muscle yep. at all costs under extreme caloric deprivation. So not do not think that you're going to lose muscle by not eating for a day or two. It's not exactly. possible. And you know, when I got into this topic originally a couple of years ago, weightlifters pushed back and said, I don't want to inhibit mTOR because I'm a, I'm a bodybuilder. I want to be building exactly. muscle mass. And I, I try to get them to understand you will build muscle mass more efficiently if exactly. you go for a period of time without calorie intake. So autophagy can break down those old proteins and accelerate your body's ability to build healthy new muscle mass. If everybody, exactly. And if every human on this planet literally went alternate days, from eating and nourishing their body, re-glycogenating and lifting, right? Doing some form of bone bearing resistance training. And then the next day didn't and did, you know, low impact, uh, moderate intensity, consider it zone two cardio, right? You would literally always be lean. You would always have improved cellular efficiency. You would cleanse your body of all the decontaminants, right? right? Yeah. Oxidative waste, free oxy radicals, all of, again, the waste byproducts that lead to aging. Yeah. Uh, what is it? Uh, AKGs, all of these bad things. And you would literally be a more efficient organism, as you said, extending your health span. But again, people don't do that. And, and obviously, as you said, it's a habit to eat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let me talk a little bit about potential side effects from rapamycin. Sure. The most common side effect are called aphthous ulcers, little mouth sores, little mouth ulcers. It'd be really kind of miserable when you get them. Canker sores, About yeah. Five percent of people get these. They clear up within several days. It's not a long-term problem, but people should be aware that they, it can happen. Yeah. You can get an elevated level of tri triglycerides. You can have lower levels of iron and hemoglobin. Those are manageable, and that's why I encourage people to get a lab panel, a metabolic yeah. lab panel, before yeah. they start, and then you'll be able to compare it at six months after you've been on rapamycin and take a look. Um, my iron levels and my hemoglobin went down a little bit. I take an iron supplement. It's not a big deal. Right. You know, and, and triglycerides and cholesterol drive me crazy. The cardiologists make such a hysterical no issue. No clue. LDL okay. cholesterol is not a bad molecule. It's only when it gets oxidized right, that it exactly. can do damage to the vascular right. system. And elevated triglycerides, it's easy to get those down. Right. Get off the processed carbohydrates. Stop <laughs> eating sugar. You know, it's, just, it's crazy. Uh, you you so and I both know that those guys are contaminated in the brain because of statins. Yes, the statin. Don't, the statin. Don't get me going on statin. Yeah, listen, the statin industry changed cardiothoracic and cardiovascular physicians' ways of treating with people. Because you and I know that those guys, one year out of med school, literally are taught over two hundred. Paid, 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 to, paid, paid to, to write pay. statin prescriptions. And you know, coenzyme Q10 is another one of my top 
life extension nutrients. Absolutely. The mechanism of statins is to block an enzyme in the liver that's responsible for cholesterol. It's production. insane. That, really blocking insane. that enzyme blocks your ability to synthesize coenzyme Q10. It, I mean, Ross, let's be honest. I mean, statins are one of the most harmful medicines in the history of the planet. I mean, you, you if you just like eliminated SSRIs and statins, you would dramatically improve the health of yeah. the aging population. And as long as we're on coenzyme Q10, I'll send a link to you that you can post in the show notes for people. I'm adamant about educating people about the necessity of crystal free coenzyme Q10. Crystal the melting point of CoQ10 is 10 degrees higher than body temperature. It crystallizes. We cannot absorb clumps of coenzyme Q10. It's got to be single molecules in solution. Company out of Denmark, Pharma Nord has a patented system for keeping their CoQ10 in solution. And people order uh, CoQ10 from Pharma Nord with a link I'll give you. They can get a 20% discount. So I'll send that to the show notes. But people need to know about crystal free coenzyme Q10. See, I didn't know about that. I use coenzyme Q10. I mean, I use the Kanaka brand of, of coenzyme Q10. And I've always known about Another it. one, the Kanaka yeah. company came out with ubiquinone, yeah. the alcohol form of uh, ubiquinol is the natural form. Kanaka, phenomenal marketing, bad yeah. science. Yeah, exactly. When you take ubiquinone, it immediately gets converted to ubiquinol in the stomach. Why spend more money right. for it when it immediately gets converted to ubiquinone in the stomach? Yep. But any, uh, that's another rant. For I felt for the marketing a long time ago, and obviously I learned that myself like four years ago. But coenzyme Q10 is a is a must have supplement. Yeah, and yeah I mean, a, 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 almost a anyone. supplement. Yep. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, all right. Well, I mean, we, we kind of hit every talking point. Is there something else that you wanted to really summarize? Yeah, I'd like to talk for a moment about the gut microbiome. Let's do. Let's and do. probiotics. Yeah. Uh, because it's a, it's a really important topic. I wrote a paper. I'll send you the link to it. But I wrote a paper titled The Microbiome Theory of Aging, which is published in a scientific journal. And I connect all the dots and explain to people how a, an imbalanced microbiome creates this problem called dysbiosis, which yes. causes leaky gut, which yes. accelerates all health problems and, and biological aging. And so what I'm trying to teach the world is, and here's a little booklet that talks about it, Dr. O'Hara's probiotics and postbiotic metabolites. People don't understand probiotic bacteria. They think for they think probiotic bacteria provide health benefits. And for decades and decades, people have had this intuitive sense that probiotic bacteria provide health benefits. That's not the way the system works. The job of probiotic bacteria is to ferment and digest food components and create secondary compounds that we call postbiotic metabolites. And it's these postbiotic metabolites that have a wide range of metabolic activity. So it's not the probiotic bacteria, it's the compounds that probiotic bacteria create that are master health regulating compounds for your entire body. And Dr. O'Hara's probiotic contains over 500 of these postbiotic metabolites in every dose. You can go to my website, naturalpharmacist.net forward slash O'Hara books. That's O-H-H-I-R-A-B-O-O-K to get a free copy of this booklet. And so one of the things I want to emphasize here in this discussion of probiotics and postbiotic metabolites, the... I regularly tell people, if you don't feed your probiotic bacteria well, they will not thrive and survive. What are the types of food that probiotic bacteria require? Dietary fibers and compounds called polyphenols. There's That's over right. 8,000 polyphenols that have been structurally identified. Polyphenols, <laughs> Doc. Polyphenols. They give, <laughs> they're the compounds that give color to fruits and vegetables. That's right. They're huge, large molecules. We don't digest and absorb these large polyphenols very efficiently, and we don't have the enzymes to digest dietary fibers. So these compounds go all the way through your digestive tract, unchanged, until they reach the colon. And in the colon, which is where 99.9% .9 of the bacteria in your intestinal tract live, dietary fibers and polyphenols are the food for your probiotic bacteria. They digest them, break them down, produce these smaller compounds, postbiotic metabolites that have a wide range of 
biological activity. Some of them are directly anti-inflammatory. Some of them directly kill pathogens. Some of them rebalance the acid base level. Let me talk about the acid base level in the intestinal tract for a minute. A healthy microbiome has a slightly acidic pH. How do you get that? Many of the postbiotic metabolites are weakly acidic compounds. There's short chain fatty acids that are propionic acid, acetic acid, lactic acid, butyric acid. There's organic acids, there's nucleic acids, there's fulvic acids. All of these weakly acidic compounds create the slightly acidic acid base balance that's optimal for the growth and proliferation of your good bacteria, and it suppresses the growth of bad bacteria. When people have microbial imbalance and dysbiosis, the acid base level is anywhere from 10 to 100 times too alkaline. You yeah. have to get it back down to this slightly acidic level to have a healthy microbiome. It's these postbiotic metabolites that do the job for you. And people have the wrong idea about commercial probiotics. Americans think more is better. Mine's got 50 billion. Mine's got 100 billion. Mine's got 200 billion. Balance and diversity are critical for the health of microbiome. You take 200 billion of one type of bacteria, it's throwing everything out of balance. I use the analogy of immigration. We let a certain number of immigrants into our country every year. That's a good thing. But if we let 200 million immigrants in, everything would be out of whack. The police system, the school system, the hospital, everything would be out of whack. So balance and diversity. And so it's not about taking a large number of one or several strains in. You want to get small amounts of as many different types of bacteria as possible. That's bacterial diversity. And the only way you can do it is by consuming a diverse range of fiber and polyphenol canine foods. I try to get people to understand the importance of consuming a little bit of as many types of food every day as possible because different types of bacteria require different types of food. I've got an eight minute YouTube video I wanna encourage everybody to watch. You can just Google Ross, R-O-S-S, -S, salad buzz, B-U-Z-Z. -Z. I teach people how to make a microbiome supporting salad. I, I've got 16 different types of vegetables in my salad buzz. And the secret after I chop everything up and process it, squeeze a lemon on there and toss it with lemon the uh, vitamin C and the lemon juice will preserve your salad buzz in a Tupperware for a week. It's a tremendous time saver because four or five nights a week, my wife and my main meal is our evening salad. I go to the refrigerator. I pull up my Tupperware. I pull up my bag of lettuce. It's got four different types of lettuce in it. A handful of lettuce, a handful of buzz, a little wild caught salmon or some garbanzo beans for protein. <laughs> two minutes to make dinner. It's a tremendous time saver and you're supporting your microbiome. So people can get a free copy of this booklet by going to naturalpharmacist.net forward slash Ohira book. You can see my eight minute YouTube video at uh, naturalpharmacist forward slash. Um, let's see, the video is, is, is uh, um, Ohira book. You know, I'm sorry, I made the, this is um, the forward slash Ohira book and um, the video is Ross's Salad Buzz. And then I'll also send you the link for the microbiome theory of aging that people can tap into. I've actually read that. I mean, I, I just want to say, first off, thank you so much for coming on this podcast. This was amazing. I mean, we covered a lot of ground and talked a lot about a lot of stuff. I want to add um, the, the microbiome is the ideology of all disease. Yep. Let's just let's just be honest. I mean, like at this point, we know that the microbiome, the gut brain is as important as this brain. Yeah. You know, it really is the internal axis uh, for everything. Everything. Right? You're right. For like every, 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 every single person on this planet that has a bad disease, it literally started. The ideology started in the gut. Well, and you know? let me explain something here that really explains why this is such a critical issue. One study I just had made a slide of and gave a presentation earlier reported that 88% of American adults, teenagers, and children have metabolic gastrointestinal problems. For sure. I've got multiple studies that report that from 90 to 95% of American children and adults do not consume adequate amounts of dietary fiber and polyphenols. So nobody's feeding their gut microbiome the foods that they need to have a healthy gut. 
And these postbiotic metabolites don't just regulate your gut, they get absorbed into your system and they influence your brain and your liver and your lungs and your kidney. They influence every single organ system, especially yeah. your immune system. Yeah. So it's absolutely critical that people understand the importance of creating and maintaining a healthy microbiome. And Dr. Hero's probiotics is the best way in the world to really uh, get positive changes in the gut microbiome because you, every dose you're absorbing 500 of these postbiotic metabolites that will immediately start to make positive changes in your gut microbiome. It's awesome. I mean, again, it's, it's just incredible how contaminated our environment is, how yeah. contaminated our food supply is. I mean, everything that comes in a box doc is, is yeah, yeah it's processed. It's all processed foods, seed yeah. oils, you know, high fructose corn syrup, yeah, I mean, you yeah. name it. There are poisons. I mean, you know, I know there are people still out there arguing that GMO feeds a large percentage of the world, but you and I both know that that's nonsense because GMO literally cannot be metabolized in the world. Man. Exactly. Yeah, I did a little research a couple of months ago. There's over four thousand fast food fast food restaurants in every state in the United States. It's insane. It's literally it's insane. insane. No, uh, no, one little another point I'll clue you into here, Jay. I'm just finishing up writing a, an article I'll get published in a scientific journal, and I'm writing a little booklet on the glutathione theory of aging. Sure. Glutathione is critically important for health, and I don't want to take time to dive into that topic today, but maybe the next time. The next show. I'll get a copy of that to you as soon as I get it finished. Awesome, man. I mean, uh, all right, you just whetted my appetite, so I'll ask you off air. So obviously, ladies and gentlemen that have watched this amazing show, Check him out at his website. It's naturalpharmacist.net. Obviously, buy his book on rapamycin. You can also follow him on Twitter, Ross Pelton, PH. And then, of course, to get your free copy of um, the book that he's talking about here tonight on probiotics and postbiotic medicine, go to naturalpharmacist.net forward slash O-H-I-R-A, or O-H-I-R-A, O H H I R A B O O K. And then you're going to send me the link for the video. Um, that you want people to watch too. And then I would just say again, thank you so much for coming on the show. Remember folks, support the amazing people that come on the Jay Campbell podcast. And remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see all of you guys very soon.